Bitcoin is going to have a massive and profound impact on human behavior. Filmmakers have a real issue when it comes to monetizing their work or even having access to a market. There's really a couple big players and they sort of control the production, they control the exhibition. Bitcoin and Lightning and digital payments have the potential to solve a lot of those issues. We're on the cusp of maybe the greatest economic period in all of human history. We want the market to do what markets do. May the best film win. What's the difference between art and propaganda? I think the answer to that is where the money's coming from. It's hard to do that on Stripe. You're not going to do that on ACH Rails. And so when that friction gets introduced, you end up with a lot of companies who are in between it, right? Like Stripe might say, hey, I don't like what's going on on IndieHub. I think that you guys are doing things that are illegal or that the government's going to say, hey, we'll we'll shut you down. So there's just these little gatekeepers that get in the way of that flow of uh, that relationship. Bitcoin is going to have a huge impact on the business models. We're going to continue to see a decentralization of voices and product and opinion. The job of an artist, in my opinion, is to really ride that line of consciousness between, you know, order and chaos. The freedom to transact is is as important, if not more important, than freedom of speech. Actions speak louder than words. Even darkness knows who writes its check. There's one authority, and that is creation. There's nothing more powerful than that. And destruction serves creation. It always has. It always will. What are you doing with like filmmaking and in connection with, with, with Bitcoin? So the idea, uh, the idea is simple. Um, we've got a film exhibition platform uh, for filmmakers to exhibit their work and um, get my knee out of the frame here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, we're just trying to make it simple. If your movie's being watched, you're being paid. If it's not being watched, you're not being paid. Uh, kind of a simple concept. So we built a platform, you know, on top of Lightning. The whole thing's kind of built on that payments infrastructure. And uh, we're just trying to utilize, you know, a global distributed payments protocol um, in order to get filmmakers paid for their work. So, you know, we allow filmmakers to uh, not just generate revenue by second, but we can also split that revenue uh, on a filmmaker's cap table if they so choose. So, um, you know, if there's five or six people, <clears throat> excuse me, if there's five or six people, uh, you know, involved in a project, they can split that revenue however many ways and whatever percentage uh, that they deem appropriate. So it's a little bit like for podcasting and fountain. Uh, it's uh, for filmmakers or for you and Bitcoin. Yeah, that's right. I, I love that. I thought. It's actually really cool because um, fountain is an amazing platform as, as I found it till now. It's that there's not too many people right now watching compared to like YouTube and, and all the other platforms, Spotify and Apple Podcasts, they are like the biggest platforms. But uh, the the quality of comments and, and uh, the feedback you get from there is like really nice. Uh, and I kind of imagine that also for, for that, what, what you're trying to do. Um, before we get into that, why did you even get started with that? Like, did you solve some, some, <laughs> some problems with cinema and, and uh, the, the movie industry? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of problems. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I spent, uh, I spent my career in film and television. I started my career as an actor, um, almost 20 years ago, did that for a number of years. And then I, uh, you know, bounced around the production side of things, directing, producing, editing, um, just kind of everything you could imagine. And when I stumbled into the crypto world in 2017, I pretty you know, once the idea connected for me that you could stream value in the way that we stream data, uh, I immediately realized that that could solve a lot of the problems that I had, both as an artist and in the business side of filmmaking. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> filmmakers have a real uh, have a real issue when it comes to monetizing their work um, or even having access to a market. Uh, you know, there's really a couple big players. And they sort of control the production. They control the exhibition. Um, you know, YouTube, in my opinion, you know, while a really cool uh, product, isn't really appropriate for the art of filmmaking. You know, we hear this, you know, it's turned into this word content, your content creator. You know, um, I don't really, I don't really know what that word means. I don't, I don't like that word. I'm a filmmaker. I'm, we make movies. You know, it's a particular kind of art form, um, you know, and that has particular expectations from an exhibition perspective and a production perspective, and it's very unique in its business model. Um, so I think that, uh, I think that there needs to be something that's more appropriate, uh, for that, you know, that structure. 
And uh, I think that I think the Bitcoin and Lightning and digital payments, you know, have the potential at least to to solve a lot of those issues. It's super interesting. Also, like uh, decentralizing the whole uh, whole thing. It, it's uh, I get more and more guests with, with uh, that are not direct in Bitcoin, but doing something with Bitcoin, uh, like even with uh, decentralizing healthcare data and also decentralizing uh, filmmaking to a certain extent. Uh, even, even though, like in DTAP is, is still a centralized platform. Uh, but it uses a decentralized platform. It's really interesting uh, what you are doing. Um, can anyone then upload a movie there, or how, do, how does it uh, is it different to a platform like Netflix or a platform like um, uh, YouTube? It'll be a little bit of a hybrid approach. Um, I think you said it well. You know, there's it's, Indie Hub is search, certainly a centralized platform um, as far as you know the servers are concerned and data is concerned and payments are concerned. Um, or I should say payouts are concerned, we're using, you know, obviously we're using Lightning, but um, <clears throat> users will, anyone can upload a project, upload a film. Uh, there'll be a, a minor screening process. You know, we just making sure there's not like obscene content or uh, inappropriate movies or, or things that aren't movies at all. You know, like we're not looking for uh, TikTok type stuff or, you know, things like that. So there's a little bit of a filter on our end. We're just making sure that it's appropriate for the platform, but we do want to make sure that it is uh, kind of a, as wide a net as possible um, within that. And we want the market to do what markets do and, you know, may the best film win. You know, if people are really watching it and they're really responding to it, you're you're getting paid. Interesting. So when you watch a movie there, uh, you pay per minute or like how does the, this, this work? So uh, the, the way the structure is now for the, from the audience side of things, you're going to pay a monthly subscription uh, to have access to the platform. So it'll feel like Netflix or Hulu or whatever. Um, and the payouts are what's happening on Lightning. Now, uh, you can pay, you know, if you want to pay that subscription in Lightning, we're going to be enabling that here shortly. We're waiting on a couple little things uh, to go through from a technical perspective. Um, but we're not at the point yet where it's like connect a wallet. Uh, and then have sat streamed directly out of that wallet. Um, that being said, we are, we're very, very early on integrating the RSS 2.0 spec. Um, so in that world, uh, users, uh, filmmakers will be able to publish their movies over RSS. And, uh, in that realm, uh, users will be able to attach a lightning wallet and actually stream sats or tip directly to that filmmaker in their cap table. So, we're trying to, you know, kind of attack both angles of it, um, but the RSS stuff, that's very, very early. I mean, we are super early on that, and and I don't expect, you know, kind of mainstream moviegoers to uh, be able to uh, facilitate that kind of tech on their end for quite some time. It's still pretty complicated. That's interesting. Uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating for me that, uh, that we can use like it, it opens up so many possibilities when when all of a sudden we have a, a protocol like lightning uh where we can actually be uh paying per whatever second minute hour what we're watching like actually like if you have a netflix subscription and and you don't watch for like uh, three months you're still paying but if you like uh, watching heavily then you're maybe like using more of the <laughs> of that and it's interesting the consume per actual like the the paying per actual consume an interesting concept which probably makes people more aware of things i don't know if it's a, a good thing when it's something like a relaxing thing like a movie i, I don't know if people get freaked <laughs> out like oh shit like uh, every, every second that i watch more than movie that uh, it's it's going off my wallet it could be a bad bad effect of, of that but it's interesting concept i love it a lot yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're still so early in this and we're, you know, Indie Hub's definitely pioneering uh, this new world. Um, I don't, I don't have, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know how all this is all going to shake out, but I, I think that, I think that there is a new business model to be had here with that. Um, and we're going to just try to make it work uh, whichever direction it goes and really just be the appropriate tool for filmmakers to monetize. So whether they want to do it over RSS or they want to do it, you know, locally on Indie Hub, uh, we 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 want them to have the ability to make that choice. You also said in the in the beginning that you see uh, a difference between you don't like the word content creator. By the way, I 
also don't like that word. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's like, yes. Yeah, like you, 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 you're doing content. It's like, okay, what, what content is like, <laughs> there's a very broad, like if, if, if someone in a company uh, is producing Excel sheets as a report, that's, that seems to be a content creator, right? Like he's producing content that should not be compared with like a, a, a filmmaker. Uh, so I don't like that word because it's very generalistic. Like every, almost everyone is making content in some sort of some sense. Um, but uh, what do you think is, is like the, the difference between um, uh, like the, the, commer the commercial movies than like indie movies, independent movies, uh, and then even something, I saw some, there, there are some sort of movies on, on YouTube also, some people that are like just trying there to be also a filmmaker there and just posted it there. Um, uh, what are the different fields and how do, how do they different? How do you see um, a YouTube YouTuber versus like a filmmaker, how would you define that? So super good question. Um, I try to boil it down to where's the money coming from? Uh, who's, who's paying you? Um, and so I, I asked the question, like, what's the difference between art and propaganda? And I think the answer to that is like, where the money's coming from? Who's paying you? Um, you know, ad-based platforms, particularly YouTube, uh, we already were all well aware that you run into major censorship issues there. Um, if advertisers don't want to be associated with a particular ideology or whatever, um, you know, they can, they can demonetize that they have outsized, um, they have outsized control over that. So, you know, in my opinion, it's really about, it really comes down to that financial relationship between artist and audience member. Um, and if we can remove as many people, uh, from, you know, the middle of that relationship as possible, then, you know, I think we've done our job. So, you know, I, there's a, there's a lot of differences between, you know, making a movie and, you know, just having a podcast, for instance, um, you know, the business of a movie is vastly more complex. Uh, you have, you know, you know, not only are you hiring potentially hundreds of people, you have, you know, you're dealing with labor, you're dealing with contracts, you're dealing with licensing. Um, you know, it's a, it's a sophisticated, complicated, uh, business model. So, you know, I just, I don't, I don't know that YouTube is the right venue from an advertising perspective. You know, you, you're, you're working for their algorithm. You're working for, you're trying to game their system that they've created in order to sell their own services to advertisers. And I think that, uh, you know, yeah, I think the primary difference is where that money's coming from. It's a good one, yeah. And also, like, I'm I'm a, a solo podcast, and I can put out one podcast a day. It would be probably really hard for me to put out a movie a day <laughs> <laughs> yeah. as a single person. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think that that there's some major difference there. Uh, really cool. Um, do you think that uh, changes? Do you, do you think that change what you're doing is uh, a little bit because of Bitcoin or, or would that happen anyways? Or is, is, is the money that we use um, uh, a factor in there? Yeah, I, I think that it is. I think that, um, you know, just just from the low value perspective, right? Like, let's say on IndieHub, we can make payments that are fractions of a penny, you know, regularly, multiple times a minute. Um you, it's hard to do that on Stripe. You're not going to do that on ACH Rails, um, you know. And so, when that friction gets introduced, you you end up with a lot of companies who are in between it, right? Like Stripe might say, "Hey, I don't, I don't, I don't like what's going on on IndieHub. I think that you guys are doing things that are illegal, or that the government's going to say, hey, we'll we'll shut you down.' So there's just these little gatekeepers that get in the way of that flow of uh, that relationship. Um, and I think that that's that's ultimately what muddies the waters the most. And, and you just end up with this very, very slow, very, very high friction environment. Um, so I think that I, I do, I think that, I think that Bitcoin has, is going to have a huge impact um, on the business models, you know, moving forward. Um, I think that we're going to continue to see a decentralization of uh, voices and product and opinions and I, I think that's a great thing. I think that's a good thing. Um, you know, I think from an, from an art perspective, you know, the job of an artist, in my opinion, is to really ride that line of consciousness between, you know, order and chaos. And they bring things in um, and reflect onto society what it is that they see. And we reward the best artists 
uh, for doing so, you know, and, and there's a, there's a direct relationship between artists and filmmakers in this, uh, in this case. And, um, for, for consciousness to, to move forward that, you know, the resolution of that reflection has to be as high quality as possible. Um, I don't know if that answered the question. It kind of went on a rant there, but <laughs> I, I love rants. It's uh, it's fascinating. I had the longest, uh, probably, uh, I don't know if it's a record, but uh, there was one guy and I mentioned that a lot. Um, he, he was uh, writing Bitcoin 21 million times. He tries to write Bitcoin down on paper 21 million times. I think he's now at like 400,000 or something like that. And he documents everything on Twitter and stuff like that. And I was like, hey, I, I have to have him on. I just want to ask him why he's doing that. And then let's see if there's a conversation. But I actually just asked him that one question. And he went on to a 55-minute rant, like <laughs> <laughs> uninterrupted. Uh, and I just asked him the question. And then he, he talked for 55 minutes. Then I had like uh, like 15 minutes more where we had some dialogue there, uh, but it was really cool. I, I didn't want to, to interrupt him. Uh, he, he really just was on a on a on a run there and uh, was like, "Hey, let's let's let him run." It's it's it, it's it's fun to hear. <laughs> in, the, in the middle, I forgot that I'm actually a, a podcast host. But <laughs> was his uh, name Michael really... Saylor? <laughs> no, the my, king of rants. No, uh, Michael, let me talk uh, even a little bit more. Like, I think we went on for one and a half hours uh, and I got to ask like th six questions or something like that. So <laughs> that's, that, that was I, almost good. I feel like that's a record for Sailor. <laughs> he just goes, man. I love it. <laughs> he just goes. Uh, the, the, that's true. That's true. Uh, by the way, how, how did you find your, your way in Bitcoin? Um. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, so a buddy of mine in 2017, <clears throat> like, had been bugging me about Ethereum mining. I don't I don't know why. You know, I think it, he was just interested in the tech and had some GPUs lying around. and was like, I, you know, he could make some money mining Ethereum or whatever. Um, and he hit me up. He'd, he'd asked me about it a few times and I was just busy and, and had absolutely no way of really diving into it. And, um, one of the days that he called me, I just literally was sitting in my office. I had absolutely nothing to do. And, uh, you know, he told me to go look into Ethereum and mining and all that. So I, I mean, I just did a little Google search. I ended up on coin market cap. This is probably like March or something, March, April of 2017. And, uh, you know, I, I honestly, within probably 45 minutes, maybe less than an hour, uh, I, I, I understood the basic concept of being able to have a, you know, uh, counterparty free peer to peer transfer of value. And I was like, wow, that's, that's massive. <laughs> this is, this is huge. Uh, I, I didn't, <clears throat> I didn't know anything about any of the tech at all. I mean, I, you know, none at all. So I was just like, I don't, I don't know what these thousands of coins are. I couldn't have told you the difference between Bitcoin or Ethereum or uh, XRP or any of it at the time. Uh, so I just, I just kind of dived in. I tried to start buying whatever I could and, <laughs> you know, sat, did, did the shit coining for a while. And, um, I, I really became obsessed, man. I, 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 I spent an outsized amount of time for years. I mean, to this day, honestly, um, paying attention to the tech and the space. And, um, it took me, it took me probably two years of, real research and um really just diving into obscure books i mean I, I my career was in film and tv i you know i didn't have any real um understanding of like sophisticated financial plumbing or treasuries or how money was created or anything like that and uh you know i would say by about 2019 i started to understand the value prop of bitcoin uh you know better than i had and one of the things that did it for me was uh, I had started building a proof of concept of IndieHub years ago. And at that time, we were building it on a on Interledger, which was developed um, by this guy, Stefan Thomas, who was one of the one of the founders and worked at Ripple. Um, <clears throat> and it was great. Like, <clears throat> I need that big jug of water you got, man. And uh, <laughs> so uh, at the time, you know, this was, you know, it, it worked in a similar way to Lightning. You know, you opened up essentially a private payment channel 
you could do 50,000 transactions a second per channel or whatever it was, you know, it's basically free. Um, and then you kind of settled on chain. It was, it was, it was a similar, uh, makeup, but lightning at that time, um, you know, was not as developed at all compared to what it is now. And so we used Interledger and it worked great. You know, it was, you know, stream, watch a movie, stream a payment, uh, fractions of, you know, micro payments, tiny every second. Uh, it was great. It worked great. But when I tried to get into the like, oh, I'm going to run a node, you know, how can, how can Indie Hub, you know, run a node on this and run the software? I realized it was like basically impossible. Uh, you needed to be, you know, have, have have an incredible amount of experience in IT and just crazy amounts of bandwidth and servers with SSD. I mean, it would have been tens of thousands of dollars a month. Like it was just totally nuts. And it was pretty much in that moment that I, I realized what Bitcoiners had been saying, the value of having these small nodes that anybody could run that didn't cost anything. Um, so that was, it was kind of like my own experience of just diving into it, realizing the importance of having a, a cheap node that anybody could run. Uh, and then uh, it was it was another couple of years of just deep, deep research. Um, you know, there were there were a few there were a few articles and a few things that really were, I mean, it was ever, there was a ton of information, but there were a few things that were just especially pivotal in my understanding of uh, the value prop of Bitcoin. Um, Breedlove's article, uh, the number zero in Bitcoin was one of them. Gigi had this article, uh, Bitcoin is time. Um, uh, John Vallis did this article called Money Messiah. And those articles, I, I mean, they just absolutely fucking blew my mind. They just blew my mind. I, I mean, I just read them like multiple times and they started to rewire my brain in ways that I just hadn't thought about the world, uh, particularly with regards to energy. Um, you know, and Gigi's article, Bitcoin is time got me into like, okay, I, I, I don't understand. I got to try to understand what time is from a, from a physics perspective. Um, and I would say that, you know, entropy, learning what entropy was, just the basic concept of that um, and how the Bitcoin uh, time chain works and creates its own time. Uh, those were those were some of the major, major pinnacles for me. It was like I had to get I had I had to just like develop a better relationship with physics. Um, and, uh, you know, it, again, it was a lot of different things. But but those in particular really, really, really had an outsized impact on my understanding of it. And, and, just, and, and then, you know, then I ended up reading a bunch of really obscure stuff. Like <clears throat> there was this really, really good interview on real vision, um, kind of early real vision days, uh, with Warren Mosler. And he, and he talked about, gave a really, really good description of how financial, the financial plumbing works. I mean, the guy just completely understands it. And, um, that got me into all of these other ridiculously obscure books. Warren Moser wrote this book called Soft Currency e Economics 2. I think he did one or there was a, a version two um, that I had to like trudge through that just totally, you know, opened my mind to how the, our financial markets worked. Um, you know, I kind of got deep into the MMT stuff. I started really reading like Stephanie Kelton's books and just just to understand the plumbing of the system. Um, so once I had kind of like the physics aspect of it, sort of grasp and then the financial plumbing aspect of it grasp um things really 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 started to click and then and then covid hit you know and it was like here's the proof like they're gonna print six trillion dollars <laughs> it was like oh my god what is going on um you know by by early 2020 i had pretty much already just moved my my um my my under my heart was with bitcoin let's say um and then as the COVID debacle played out, I, it just kind of proved the whole thesis. And I was like, wow, okay. So then I, I basically just got out of everything else that I was holding on to out of basically just a lack of understanding and fear. <laughs> um, kind of the like, I'm going to diversify because I don't really know anything. Um, you know, it was that classic chart, right? Like understanding of Bitcoin, <laughs> allocation of Bitcoin, <laughs> straight up. Um, and so 
uh, I was still developing Indie Hub at the time, and 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 I kind of just made a, a bet, and I was like, I hope that Lightning is as developed as I need it to be, because I need somebody to just create a product that I can plug into. I'm not trying to run a money transmission business. It's not. I, I have no interest in running nodes, you know, and doing anything like that. That's not my business. And it kind of just like lined up perfectly. Uh, some companies started offering uh, Lightning services, um, and and that was kind of it, man. It just. That was it. It was like, I, under, I understand this. I understand why we're doing this. Um, it's kind of no going back. Super interesting. Um, it's also interesting how this transition is going. Um, I asked that question a, a lot because I really want to grasp how Bitcoin will transform society in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, and that's why I'm interested in like how people fought before Bitcoin and how people think after Bitcoin. Mm. Uh, and a lot of things, I think have to do because we are in an early crowd and we also get impacted by that early uh, and we are a small community and, and we have like a, this group thinking a little bit in there, uh, even though we get way bigger uh, these days. But I do think money has an impact on our thinking, on our incentives and will change something in society. So that's why I ask uh, in what way did Bitcoin change your perspective on wealth and time? Super good question. <clears throat> For me, I think I, I think I fit into the category that a lot of people fit into, which is that, um, you know, I, I was raised um, with fairly simple principles, you know, just sort of ethics and morals, you know, work hard, save your money, do right by um, the people that you work with. You know, your word is your bond, trust. Um, and as I, you know, the first part of my, you know, professional career, I, I was I was just an actor and I had, um, I don't want to downplay that. It is important, but I had, I would say like negative respect for finances or money. Um, I, I really, I mean, I just had, I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea how any of this worked. And as I started to switch over to the production side of things, I started to run my own businesses and I started hiring people and I started, uh, you know, on my business journey. <clears throat> and what happened to me was I started to realize that I was trying to do business the right way, uh, you know, treat people fairly, <laughs> be honest, um, you know, do things in a, in a respectable manner. And I realized that I was not incentivized to do that, um, from a regulatory perspective. Like it was, it was the government that was getting in the way. Um, and it was basically forcing me to behave in a way that was against the interests of myself, the people I was working with and my customers. Um, and so I, I just had this like general, frustration and general sense that like this isn't this doesn't make any sense like this isn't how things should be um this isn't how m my family was brought up this isn't how they operated in their life you know and uh but it wasn't anchored to any kind of functional understanding it was just like this growing frustration that 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 the incentive structures just seemed totally perverse and corrupt um and so I guess what I'm what I'm trying to get at is that I think that Bitcoin brings us back to what we all sort of innately understand at this like base layer of relationship and behavior and and how we conduct ourselves and how important it is and necessary it is for human beings to cooperate at scale. Um, and when people are in the middle of you cooperating, it just, you know, there's just a massively negative result. Um, and so you know, I, Bitcoin just came in and it was like, yes, this is, yes, this is how it should be. <laughs> like, this is, this is how I was raised for things to, to, uh, how the structure was, you know, it implied in my upbringing. And so for me, it was like, it, I wouldn't say that it changed my behavior. I would say that it reverted my behavior back to what I just innately and instinctually thought it should have been in the first place. Um, particularly as an American, you know, like we, we have a strong sense of individualism and, you know, I don't, 
really have any interest in being told what to do and I'm going to take my risks and I should get the reward for taking that risk. And, um, you know, I, I think that, I think that just, I, I just think that Bitcoin is like a little bit closer to natural law in that, in that respect. Um, and so I do, I, I think that, I think that Bitcoin is going to have a massive and profound impact on human behavior. And I think that it, I think that it is going to kind of reset us back to where we are natural, our more natural state, if that makes sense. It makes total sense. And it's so funny for me because uh, sometimes I talk with people outside of Bitcoin and when I come at that angle of like, oh yeah, Bitcoin will bring us back to how nature actually wanted to be. Uh, nature actually wanted us to have money. I, from an outside perspective, it's really hard to understand that because it's like a, a highly technical thing. Uh, you need computers to run it. Uh, you need all those uh, fancy things, your wallets, your your things. Like it's, uh, it seems not true. And but then you understand, okay, yeah, like we cannot use something directly from nature as money. Uh, so we kind of translate nature's energy uh, with the proof of work algorithm into something digital. So I can also send this across the ocean uh, and to someone else to actually use it because otherwise it's not gonna work anyways in a globalized digitalized world where uh, people from America work with people from Asia and they work uh, with people from Austria again. So this is something that we need. We will never go back to something not digital. And I rather have a digital Bitcoin than a digital Euro <laughs> or, or, or some digital X or B or something like that. So in that sense, it's the it's the most most natural way of, of money ever invented. And it's a, it's a hard hard thing to understand. But I think once you're there, it, it kind of makes sense in in that sense. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, absolutely. And like, you know, I. When I'm when I'm in the process of of like explaining Bitcoin or I'm orange pilling people, um, you know, I I realize I have to go back most of the time to my to where I started, which was zero. You know, I no idea, of, no real concept of money as a tool or a technology, which is something that was assumed. Um, and you know, I have to just start at the very very basics and generally speaking in those conversations the presupposition that people have is like that the money should hold some value they they assume that it does but haven't put a ton of thought into it um and that we should be able to transact without asking permission to transact you know i i'm a big believer in the idea that uh the freedom to transact is is as important if not more important than freedom of speech um, you know, uh, actions speak louder than words and, uh, you know, how we express ourselves behaviorally using money as a tool is, um, you know, in a, on a planet of 8 billion people, probably the most important tool that all of us use collectively. I, I just don't think that there's anything more important than that tool. Um, and if that expression, um, is, is, distorted or perverted or augmented based on the whims of somebody else, then, then, then humans don't get to iterate in as quickly as we need to, in order to progress. And so we just end up being totally hamstrung and stuck, you know, and, and that's no good. Like we gotta, we can't be stuck. We have to move forward. You know, <laughs> like we can't, we can't, energy has to move, man. It really does. I even go one step further. I feel like uh, the freedom to transact and the freedom of of money moving is for me freedom of speech in in a way because freedom of speech means uh, for me uh, the freedom to communicate whatever I want. And I, if I cannot communicate to someone else my financial energy, freedom of speech is actually um, uh, challenged in, in in that way. So if if my bank says, "Hey, uh, you, you cannot." Uh, transfer that money to to that person uh, because that person might be bad, uh, and even if they are right, they violate my right of freedom of speech. In in my sense, in my in, in my understanding, maybe maybe that goes too far, or maybe that is a different. Uh, it's a weird uh, a way of thinking of freedom of speech, but uh, that that's at least how I look at it. Yeah, I, I mean, I I totally agree. Um... You know, I it kind of a separate tangent here, but I one of the I, I would say, you know, Bitcoin led me on a 
spiritual path and a spiritual journey as well. And there's, um, I, I was not aware. I, I was not personally aware at all of how much fear uh, dictates a, 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 an outsized amount of human behavior um, until COVID hit. When COVID hit, I just, I had just really, I don't generally don't live my life operating at that frequency. And, um, when COVID hit and I started to see the destruction that was downstream of making decisions out of fear, um, it really, a lot of light bulbs went off for me. Um, and I, and I realized that fear from a, from a vibrational perspective is essentially the, it's the vibration of destruction. Um, you know, I, I looked at my life and I looked at the choices that I'd made and, and I, and I realized pretty much unequivocally that all of the best decisions and all of the best work and all of the best relationships I'd ever had were, uh, rooted in love. And, um, all of the worst decisions I'd ever made were rooted in fear. And when my life was, uh, you know, on a downward trajectory, let's say, um, it was almost always because I was, I was operating out of a place of fear. The, the reason I say that is because I, I, um, there's a, I, I suppose there's a strong case to be made for trying, you know, control comes from fear a lot of the time. I mean, I think there's, there's just people who are legitimately evil. There's sociopathic, uh, that's kind of a different topic, but I think a lot of people, uh, if you're operating from a place of fear, you can, you start to try to control things and you start to try to control behavior and you start to try to control how people think. And I, I think that in the long run, uh, that's just, it's just net negative. Um, you know, th there's this, uh, Jason Lowry, um, I think it was Lowry in, in either a, one of his posts or podcasts or his book, maybe all of them. Uh, he made this really, really crazy point that stuck with me, man. And this just like, th uh, this will never leave me. And he basically said that at the battle of Gettysburg, um, when they went to collect the bodies and the weapons and clean up the battlefield, they, they realized that some insanely large percentage of the guns hadn't even been fired. And furthermore, a lot of the guns had two or three, uh, balls of ammunition, you know, shoved into their musket, which suggests that not only were people not firing their weapon, but they were pretending to fire their weapon. They were pretending to shoot and they were pretending to reload. And, you know, the implication of that in my mind is that the overwhelming majority of people are not like our base state is not violent and aggressive. Like at a, at a, at the core base layer of our brain, we understand how important it is to be peaceful and to cooperate. And, for us to progress, it, it has to be in a peaceful way. It has to be in a creative way. It cannot be in a destructive way. Um, now, now fear and destruction certainly has its place. Uh, you know, things need to be, uh, you know, destroyed in order to be built back up. Like it's just part of the process. But, um, you know, this, this fear that people are going to, oh, they're going to transact. They're going to do things I, I don't like them to do or whatever. Um, that's just, it's, it's just that it's just fear. Um, and if I, I fundamentally believe I'm not cynical in this regard that if, if humans have the opportunity to, uh, transact freely, uh, we will see just an unfathomable amount of positive growth. And then of course there's, there's insane people and there's, there's disgusting things that happen. There's no question about that. But I think that, uh, being controlling and trying to control transactions, I think leads to more, uh, more behavior that is, you know, just frankly, not in line with, uh, kind of the base, the base layer of being a human being. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep 
the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for a hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there. And of course, also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love Love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions i love those watches so so much i mean it, it, it comes down to any into every invention ever made like uh, it, you can say the same thing about fire about knives about gunpowder about everything Th there is always if you justify not allowing innovation to prosper because uh, one percent of the population might abuse it for something bad, that's that's always a really bad. <laughs> that's always a really bad angle. Yeah. Uh, so uh, of course criminals will use Bitcoin because everyone will use Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> so, so of, of course criminals use uh, knives, but I still like knives to cut my onions. <laughs> so, I, I, I don't, I don't want to squeeze them. So, like it, it's, it's for me really interesting how how people look at that, and and I really like how electricity got adopted. Uh, and uh, you see those old comics that were painted, where where like oh they made propaganda against uh, electricity because they thought it will be really bad and the whole world will uh, goes down a, a really bad lane. But now a world without electricity, and I'm aware that there are parts in the world where actually people live completely without electricity, and that part of the world is not even that small. Um, but uh, in everyone that is listening right now, uh, their life is probably really complicated if they have tomorrow no electricity anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Net, net negative, dude. Like, and from an energetic perspective, right? This is, this is one of the things I started to be able to see the world more from an energetic perspective, right? Like, you can't create energy, you can't destroy energy. We can transmute, which is incredible, right? Like, we're like wizards in that respect. You know, we can we can take what's here and we can rework it into something else, and that's kind of the base layer. But like, um, you know, there was this uh, uh, really good TED talk. Um, uh, I think it was I think it was Brene Brown uh, in one of her TED Talks, and she talks about she was trying to find she was doing research about uh, you know people who have meaning in their life, you know, basically. And long story, it's a great TED Talk, highly recommend go check it out. But from an energetic perspective, essentially what she found out was that you can't take away the highs, you can't take away the lows, sorry, and and still have the highs. You, you, if if you take away one, you compress you know, our, our energetic reality to this like middle band of, of, uh, you know, you, you give somebody antidepressants and you're also cutting off their happiness at the same time. They're maybe they're not as depressed, but they're not as happy. 
And so you, you try to start manipulating how energy works and it's going to squirt out somewhere else. Like it just, there's no, there's no way around it. Um, you know, and we, we, we have to have some element of trust and faith and love in order to continue to move forward without any guarantee of safety. Um, you know, but, but the irony is the more, the more of a guarantee of safety you're looking for, the less safe you become, you know, I think it's kind of how I see it. Percent. And I talked about, about that on the podcast already, but for me, volatility is vitality. Mm -hmm. Like you, you need, uh, that to, to make uh, noise and there will come a point where bo a Bitcoin is super boring. Where, where yeah. Bitcoin is just like everyone has Bitcoin. It is this thing that like, yeah, it's really big news if it shoots up 1.7% in a year in purchasing power, uh, because then it's like, oh, what happened this year? Like it's, it's, that would be huge news if, if Bitcoin moves more than 1% or in that scenario, Bitcoin is actually the thing that we are measuring everything in. So, uh, it's, it's more like, uh, it's, it's, it's massive if prices move down more than 1% or something like that. So like that, that's, I think more the, the way to, to think about that. But at that point, I will find something else to talk about. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I will not, I will not, um, talk about Bitcoin when it's boring. So till it's, uh, till it's uh, not boring. And I think the next like 10 years, I guess, will definitely not be boring in Bitcoin. Uh, but at some point it will get boring and then I'm like, yeah, let's, let's, let's find something else that I'm passionate about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like a hundred percent, you know, we get back to what we should be doing here, which is, uh, you know, getting more efficient at things, getting better at producing things, uh, being more creative, you know, I mean, human beings, like I say, we're, we're wizards. We have this incredible ability to transmute energy. Um, and I think that that's in service of something. I think that, I think that we have, uh, you know, part of our job here is to sort of solve for entropy and uh, make things, make sure that, that, that this party doesn't end any sooner than it has to, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, it, you know, in that case, if Bitcoin's going up, let's say 2% a year, well, that's great. That means that we got 2% better at, at uh, doing whatever it is that we need to be doing, you know, and that should be celebrated. Absolutely. That's, uh, that's also uh, just a side note. I think that's what a lot of people don't get about inflation. Even if we are saying CPI is actually inflation, which I completely disagree with, we are measuring from zero and we should be measuring from where we have a productivity gain because we are getting more efficient in doing stuff. So like, even if inflation is just 7%, in reality, we should not measure it from zero. We should measure it from like minus 10% and then inflation is like 27% or something like that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but, oh, but, man. but then we, <laughs> you, you, you get it, right? It, it, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's that, it, it's that, um, um, Jeff Booth, um, uh, I think, uh, really made that concept popular. And, and I think it's such a genius way to think about it. when Jeff Booth told me that uh, I was, I was mind blown to be honest like that. When I heard about the price of tomorrow and how he uh, 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 explained it, I was like, that's so simple. Why I did not think about that at all in my uh, whole years of studying uh, money and investing in stocks and, and doing all these things. Like I, I felt really stupid in that moment. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I think it goes, I think that that goes back to the point we were making earlier, which is that we all just have this base level of understanding that, that, which is Jeff Jeff's point of things should be getting cheaper over time. Like all of the complexity that we have to learn, like if I'm orange pilling somebody, like all of this financial complexity is really, the work isn't in saying, hey, uh, which is, you know, things should be getting cheaper over time. We should be getting better at manufacturing things. Uh, that's a simple concept. Like we all understand that intuitively. The, the challenge is in having to explain how the system currently is because it's it's fraudulent. And so we have to explain how and why it's fraudulent. We have to rewire the brain, expose the lie so that people can go back to appreciating what their their base assumption was in the first place. You know, like I one of the one of the things that I like to one of the examples that I like to use for people, um, if they have a house, if they have a mortgage, um, and I say, look, okay, your house over the last, whatever, 10 years is up 50%. Can you sell that house in the same neighborhood and buy a bigger house in that neighborhood? And of course the answer is no. And so I go, 
are you actually richer in 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 that context <laughs> like, like no i guess not you know now obviously that only holds up in like a localized neighborhood you know if you're moving somewhere else but but i mean even like us real estate prices they just in aggregate they just riding this wave of money um and uh you know, that, that tends to click with people. They go, Oh yeah, I guess I can't buy a bigger house. So it's nominally, it went up real terms. It went down and then they can, that's a good way to kind of get into the nominal versus real, uh, discussion and debate. But anyway, I, I just, it, it doesn't have to be this complicated. The only reason it's complicated is because the rules are insane and, you know, we have to like expose the insanity. <laughs> yeah. It's also interesting. And people are like, oh, Bitcoin is so complicated. Really? Explain, <laughs> me, the fear. <laughs> Explain me the fiat system, please. <laughs> like, I, I still don't, still don't get what's, what's going on there. Uh, yeah. Really interesting. Um, another question that came up to me when, when, when you were talking about, um, violence, um, do you think that Bitcoin has a chance to limit or end wars to, to a certain extent? I do. Um, I definitely do. Um, like I said, I, I, the, <laughs> I had this, I had this realization at one point, you know, and I'm free to feel free to critique me on this or call me an idiot or whatever. But, um, you know, you look at a situation right now, I mean, it's global. The, the craziness is global right now for sure. But let's say, let's just look at the middle East. because it's especially crazy. Um, you know, in my opinion, the natural state of things is, is, um, beautiful. It's peaceful. It's balanced. Um, and when things are as insane as they are, particularly given that the overwhelming majority of people really don't want to pick up a gun and shoot somebody. Like we really don't, you know, like, like we don't. <laughs> um, I know there's people who are cynical who think that we're just sort of naturally violent and whatever. I, I just categorically disagree with that. And so if things are as crazy as they are, it's just, it's antithetical to the natural order of things. And so in my mind, it, it just is very clear that when things are that disorderly, it's by choice. Someone or something or some group of people is intentionally creating chaos and pitting people against each other who would otherwise have no interest in fighting each other. Most people are just like, I'll just go this way and we'll cooperate and whatever. Um, we really don't want to get down to shooting each other in the face. You know, that's just not the natural state of people. So um, I, I do. And I think that when people have the freedom to transact and the freedom to opt out of a system that uh, sort of forces them into violence, which is kind of how I feel like a lot of this is going on. Um, you know, I, I, I do think that the potential is there that we're on the cusp of maybe the greatest economic period in all of human history. Um, I, I could be insane, but it, it makes sense to me. <laughs> it also makes sense for me. The one thing that still doesn't make sense for me where I'm undecided is if we can get to that future peacefully, <laughs> I, I get when, once we have Bitcoin, uh, <laughs> I think it will be more peaceful. I think there will be still, um, sort like a form of war, uh, but I think it will be extremely limited and only wars where the people actually want to fight them. Right now we have that weird thing where when the government says we are at war, all of a sudden, even if maybe it's just 10% of the population actually wants war, 100% of the population is at war uh, because they have the money printer and they can just like get the financial energy from it. If you all of a sudden have to raise taxes for a war, you have to explain it to everyone. And uh, most likely most people will disagree with that. Um, if you had that future, I think that will be really good for wars and peace. Uh, so like we will have way more peace than, than any wars. And if we have a war, that's probably some war that actually makes sense to a certain group of people. Um, but I, I have a hard time understanding if, if we even have this, but then there's human nature also involved in that. But the one thing I have really hard, a uh, hard time understanding uh, if we come to that point from like now fears to then Bitcoin in a peaceful manner, because there are those fiat money printers that really want to protect uh, their uh, good status of like just having the money printer and with Bitcoin, they don't have a money printer. Do, do you think also that we could get to us to that stage, the transition phase of, of the hybrid Bitcoinization in a peaceful manner? 
It's a, I think that I, I think that's the question of the times. I really do. Uh, I think that that's kind of the only relevant question. Can we make this transition peacefully? I think that it's possible. Do I think that it will definitely happen peacefully? I don't know. I would say 50, 50, um, you know, if you, the way I kind of look at it is, uh, you know, like cancer, you know, cancer is, is, you know, unregulated cell growth, right? Your body's not able to, um, use its natural processes to, to kind of slough off, um, toxic cells. Um, you know, I, we could be going through this, this period where it's kind of this one last gasp of, um, cancerous energy that we have to contend with, you know, on, on the one hand, I think that in a lot of ways, that'll be good for Bitcoin. You know, there's a lot of people who don't understand the value proposition of Bitcoin, and I'm not sure that they will understand it until things get excruciating for them. Um, so I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I, I think it's possible that we can't get there without some level of violence. But I, at the same time, I also think that that level of violence will be instrumental and necessary to get us to that next phase, because you're going to have to convince a whole lot of people that there's an alternative, that there's an exit, and it doesn't have to be violence. I mean, to your point earlier, like for most people, violence is the absolute last choice uh, that, that you could possibly make. Like, I don't, I do not want to, if there's a dispute, I want to try to resolve it in any way conceivable uh, unless it's absolutely necessary that I turn violent. Um, so I, I, I don't, in that situation, like it, it's kind of ridiculous to say like, that's good for Bitcoin. Like it, you know, violence isn't good, but I think that it could be the energetic thrust that, you know, the cancer sort of eats itself, the host dies in this case, you know, kind of metaphorically society goes like, okay, we're done with this for quite some time. And it really is the final catalyst to get us into this new world. But I don't think that that's, I, I'm just saying I could see that. I don't think that it's fundamentally necessary for us to do, to get there. Um, you know, kind of maybe taking the other side of that argument is like, if in my own perspective, if people don't want to commit violence and there is this escape hatch, um, it's possible that even just the threat and the uncomfortable reality of violence will force them there before they ever turn violent. And and maybe that uh, stymies it before, you know, anything super global pops off anyway. Um, I, I don't know. I don't have a strong opinion about it. I'm certainly not hoping for it. I'm certainly not rooting for it. You know, it, in my mind, um, I would like to see a slow orderly transition into this new world. I, I would rather see Bitcoin's price go up slowly and consistently. You know, if it if it spikes to a million bucks in the next three years, like I think that that's an indication like we have serious problems. Um, and I'm not I'm not going to be rooting for that. Um, you know, I, I, I would rather it be slow and steady and peaceful. One other aspect that I want to get into this conversation, um, is the, the digital war that's going on that I participate in. <laughs> uh, we have we, <laughs> the, 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 the information, uh, cyber war that is going on between different financial religions <laughs> in, in a sense where I, uh, I fight for Bitcoin online every day and try to like get across the message of sound money and, and Bitcoin uh, with the podcast, with Twitter on primal, pr I mean, on primal, probably most people on, on Nostra, most people are already uh, ki kind of uh, Bitcoiners, but uh, th th that's a, a, a war aspect that not a lot of people see as a war. Uh, maybe war is not the, the best uh, word also for that, but it's it's kind of like you have those digital uh, soldiers that fight an, an information war because there's so much information out there and you can get down uh, a complete fiat route and there are a lot of, uh, let's call the word content creators out there, uh, the influencers, however you want to call it, that actually are completely in that fiat world and they promote that fiat world. Oh, you buy an ETF, uh, you, you do that, you get there and yield and you do that. So th that's a whole nother world. But I don't like, I, I, I'm on the other side, I'm like, hey, buy, uh, buy and hold Bitcoin. 
uh, and it's 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 kind of a, a different war where we we fight digital about attention. And I guess every subscriber, every like, every comment, every engagement thing that you get more on the Bitcoin side is is kind of win for 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 Bitcoin. Uh, it's it's an interesting. Um, I never really thought about it in that way, but when you were explaining it, I was like, oh, in in, in some sort, I'm in a, in a digital war, uh, fighting for Bitcoin, not not very brutally. <laughs> like uh, like I, I I respect everyone, and we we don't point guns at each other. There are like debates even where we sit next to each other, and and we 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 don't even touch each other. <laughs> like we don't even uh, fight each other any anyway physically. Uh, but there's uh, probably m- maybe that's that, maybe that's the way how how Bitcoin will get adopted, not with a, a physical violence, but with like uh, information violence, <laughs> in a, in a sense. At least that would would I, that's a war that I would get behind, like a digital information war. <laughs> uh, I do a hundred percent. We're in it, man. There's no question about that. You know, um, I think that. Um, you know, kind of back to my early, early point about creativity, you know, and human beings have this really interesting ability to like manifest, you know, the way I see things is like, we have two, we have two realms. We have, I call it the Akashic realm. That's like a bad word for it, but you've got the realm of information and you've got the realm of physics. Um, at side note, you know, this is one of the things that's so fucking mind blowing about Bitcoin is that it's fusing these realms. It's fusing the information realm with the physical realm. I mean, once you connect the dots on that, it's like, it's just absolutely mind blowing. Um, but I do see a lot of times when I, I'm thinking about what's going on in the world, I do see it as, um, uh, we human beings are the physical manifestation of the war of ideas of the war of information that's kind of floating around. Um, and we're, we're expressing in the physical realm, um, what was manifested from the, the Akashic realm or the, the, the realm of information and ideas. Um, so I, I totally agree with that. I think that we're absolutely in it. Um, and and that's fine. Like that's, that's where human beings should stay. We, we have the ability to hash things out, uh, without having to resort to physical violence, um, through things like debate, you know, this, this mind virus idea, like that is Bitcoin and there's mind viruses that are, you know, more destructive and negative. Um, but you know, I, I think that you can't, you can't save everybody from themselves. Uh, some people really, really, really need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the stove is super hot, you know, like you can't, you can tell them all day long. You could show somebody getting burned that like, it's not going to matter. They have to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this stove is hot. And so I think in, in those situations as Bitcoiners, the best we can do is just patiently be a beacon of light, you know, in, in a realm of darkness. And at some point, if someone has the capability or the willingness uh, to, to open their eyes and recognize that there is light in this cave of darkness and they go towards that light, we just have to make sure that we represent that light as best as possible. Um, you know, uh, welcoming, uh, kind, loving, um, you know, responsible people, which I think is generally like the overwhelming, some of the overwhelming characteristics of Bitcoiners. They're, they're generally not cynical. They're generally hopeful. They're generally creative. They're generally, um, there's just great, they're just great people. So, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, to, to try to win that war, the best we can do is represent in the physical realm. Uh, what that idea, the best version of what that idea could look like and be like, if that makes sense. That absolutely makes sense. Uh, I love also how, how you put it. Um, as we already w- over one hour that, that flew by really quickly, um, I have a few questions that I really want to get into because you are from movie making. Um, what are your favorite Bitcoin movies which aren't Bitcoin movies? Oh man, uh, hot seat. Um, you know, First of all, I got plenty of time, so if we got to keep going, no rush. Um, um, there, are, there are a number of us uh, filmmakers, the Bitcoin filmmaker crossover group, um, who are generally very dissatisfied with 
uh, the Bitcoin cinema world right now. Um, you know, a lot of the, the, the Bitcoin movies are, they're just very factual. Uh, you know, they, they just kind of get into, uh, these sort of myopic debates about the nature of money and things like that. And that's great. Like that's, that's fantastic. But, um, most people's portal into, um, having some revelation about something like this is going to be through uh, like superlative human experiences, right? There's the stories that we tell over and over and over again. And the way that we get into these stories and we, we, we have empathy for characters that are going through a human experience. And, uh, you know, all of that's to say that I think that I think that here in the future, we're going to see a lot more movies that have these themes in them, but put Bitcoin as like a secondary or tertiary sort of subplot. Um, they need to be great movies first that are, you know, universal um, and well-crafted. And Bitcoin needs to be something that uh, people sort of come to, you know, accidentally. I mean, it, when you're making a movie, uh, th the people who do it the best you know, it's a, it's a highly sophisticated emotional manipulation machine, you know, like when you're making a movie, you're, you're, you're aiming for certain beats, you're looking for certain reactions, you're, you're crafting a particular emotional experience. I mean, that's your job. And, uh, the people who do it the best are the ones that get an audience to come to those, to, to feel like they're coming to those conclusions on their own rather than those ideas being shoved down their throat. Um, and so I think right now we're in this like very early phase of Bitcoin where it's just like a lot of a lot of factoids and information just sort of being shoved down people's throats. But we haven't yet really hit uh, like a world class storyteller, um, you know, using those themes. So I guess the answer is I don't have one yet. Um, we're kind of waiting. You know, hopefully I can be involved in some of those when they pop down the line. <laughs> um, you know, I. It's sort of a cop out answer. I think also like some of the, you know, the, some of the great works of all time, whether it's music or movies or fine art or whatever, um, that seek truth above all else, you know, that's a Bitcoiner movie. You know what I mean? Like, like I am going to put my neck out in order to try to, to seek a deeper truth or present a deeper truth. Um, and so you know, I, I guess I guess what I'm saying and part of what I'm doing at Indie Hub is that if we can if we can reorient that relationship between filmmaker and audience member, um, we're going to see a lot more movies that feel like Bitcoin esque. But really, that's just that's just a function of artists being able to get rewarded and take risk and 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 do their jobs. In other words, movies will get better over time. They'll get more universal. They'll get more human. Um, you know, we've, the, the industry has, has gone off on this like fiat tangent over the last, you know, 10 or 15 years. And it feels more like propaganda than art. You know what I mean? I absolutely do. It's interesting for me also, as you said, Bitcoin movies that, that aren't really Bitcoin movies, like, uh, I think about the matrix Truman show, yeah. the big short in time, there are a lot of, uh, really great movies. If, if you watch them. And you are a Bitcoiner, you're like, oh, I can relate a lot to the Bitcoin there. I mean, especially in Matrix. I mean, Matrix is for probably the the number one movie that is always uh, brought up. But I I do actually think also like I, there's not that one actual Bitcoin movie uh, where I'm like, yeah, that's that's a great great movie. There are a lot of documentaries. There are a lot of those kind of films. They're great, but they're not a movie. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are, as you said, they are factual. They're not emotional. Like you really want to, if you, you want to watch a movie, you want to feel that emotional connection to, to the characters, uh, to the story. Uh, and it really, uh, it, it should be a movie that a non-Bitcoiner is watching and also rooting for Bitcoin in that process. It's probably a really hard thing to do. And maybe we need one gigantic event in Bitcoin that hasn't happened yet, where uh, you then can wrap a story around that event and get some Bitcoin before that. I don't, I don't maybe you know, maybe that just didn't happen till now. Um, uh, I don't know. 
I, I don't know if it's a positive or a negative uh, story, probably negative, like, yeah, would, would, would be interesting what, what that story uh, could be, uh, what, what that could actually, what that event could trigger such a, a big movie where also like a, a big uh, creators uh, and storytellers would then also get behind and make that movie. It will be interesting to see, but uh, I definitely also wait for one. Like I am eager to, to see a, a real Bitcoin movie that has um, uh, that class of like a Matrix uh, movie. That, that that movie is amazing. It's interesting uh, when I watch the Matrix movie, I cannot really watch it. I get so motivated to work on something like in the middle of the movie. It's 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 really hard for me to watch that movie without getting motivated. <laughs> yeah, I I yeah I totally agree. I, I I'll 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 append my answer to yes, the Matrix. <laughs> I mean, I really that movie just holds up, man. It's so well done. Um. It's just so good. Um, you know, I think that, you know, at, there's a lot of, um, I shouldn't, I, I don't say a lot. I, I, I come across like kind of an unspoken assumption a lot of times in the Bitcoin space that like 15 years is a long time or 16 years is a long time. Like it is not like we are, we are in the, you know, this is like a toddler. Um, we are so early in the lifespan of this um, and in the cultural, like kind of the cultural echoes of the technology. Uh, you know, like uh, this is a really weird analogy, but like when cell phones started to become super ubiquitous, there was a whole period of time where filmmakers really struggled with how to technically integrate a cell phone into a story. Like how do we, okay, they would text here and then it, we'd all be like, well, how do we shoot the phone? And like, or do we just do it digitally on screen. And like, if you go back to this transition to this period, you'll see all these, all these crazy ways that people tried to integrate that technology. I mean, this literally took years, <laughs> you know, this is just a phone. So, um, I, I think that, you know, I, I haven't thought about it this deeply until this conversation, but I, I happen to think that now I'll put, I'll put my bet out in this way. I think that as the world is descending into chaos, through that chaos will be some some timeless classic movies will come out of this um because you have turmoil and you have tension and you have all of these things that reveal character reveal the trajectory of humanity through strife and conflict i think that the i think that the what who will be the big artists of the next 15 or 20 or 30 years are just being born. And I don't mean that literally. I mean that just like artistically and technologically. Um, so I think that some of the movies that get made about this time uh, that are able to integrate Bitcoin just as a technology, as how a main character used it to escape uh, a war zone or oppression or human trafficking or whatever, like whatever the use case is, somebody's going to um, really make a movie that, everyone agrees is kind of the gold standard for representing that period of existence. Um, and I think that that, I think that those will be the ones that start to, you know, become the good, the best Bitcoin movies thematically. Um, I, I, so I think that we're at the very beginning of this. And I think that the next 15 years are going to be um, absolutely massive and unprecedented for that type of uh, work to be uh, created. I 100% agree. And, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a great endpoint also the podcast, but uh, I really love to, I would love to see an amazing Bitcoin podcast with, uh, amazing Bitcoin movie in the next like five years. I, I would love just like this, this two and a half hour long thriller that actually, uh, friends that are not in Bitcoin are actually excited to see. And there's like some really big stars in there and like, uh, some, some like really a, a, a big movie that would be really, uh, something amazing, but we probably need a lot of price action in Bitcoin and some turmoil, as you said, uh, in, in the financial system, but I, I could, I could see it. Yeah. I, um, what, yeah, I, what? I think, I think, it, you know, I think it'll happen, uh, selfishly. I hope to be instrumental in that. I hope Indie Hub is instrumental in that. Um, there are definitely some, uh, huge Bitcoiners in the entertainment industry. Um, most of them are quiet about it. They don't really want to be known about it or associated with it yet. There will be a time where they can monetize their films and their projects where they're not under the thumb of a publicly traded company or network. 
um, and they'll be able to take that risk and earn that outsized reward. I hope that Indie Hub can play a huge role in that. Um, but all of that's to say that the energy's there, the talent is there for sure. Um, I think it's really just a matter of how do we get them uh, to be able to make money on a movie like that uh, that's got a budget of you know tens of millions at least um, and and without having to deal with studio executives that uh, you know have no interest in telling a Bitcoin story. I, I think that we're I think that we're on the verge of that. I, I would I would imagine it starts to happen here in fairly short order. Hopefully, less than five years. I uh, would love to see it. Really, really cool. Um, perfect. Then, uh, what one question that I always ask my guest is: What can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? And I add for you uh, besides filmmaking. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Oh man! Um, I I don't know. I hope I hope that um, I hope that some of the stuff I said was was able to offer some you know, a, a, an interesting or fresh perspective on some of this. I know that, I know that the Bitcoin podcast, we tend to just cycle through the same commentary over and over again, but I hope that, I hope that, that I was able to offer a little something here just sort of organically, um, inorganically, uh, man, I, I would, I don't know. I would just point to my own story, I guess. Um, you know, I, I started out my life probably a lot more, cynical than I am now. I wasn't like full blown hardcore. Cyn I've never been a hardcore cynic or anything like that. Um, but I guess it would be that, you know, there is a tremendous amount of reasons to be, um, hopeful and positive and creative and constructive. Um, it's a scary time. Things are very disorderly and becoming more disorderly by the day. Um, but I, I think that that's a necessary component to this whole um, to this whole process. I, I had this realization um, a, a little while ago about darkness, and it was the realization was like if if darkness is rolling through town, um, it's probably not there for you. Like you can just get the fuck out of the way. Like you can just continue to go build and be loving and kind and creative. Like you don't, you don't need to um, try to fight something that may not actually be looking for you. Um, you know that darkness and destruction. Um, I'll put it this way: like there is nothing that is more powerful than the frequency of creation itself. Full stop. Even darkness knows who writes its check. Like there's one authority and that is creation. There's nothing more powerful than that. And destruction serves creation. Um, it always has, it always will. Um, so if, if it's not there for you, thank it, have gratitude for it because it's there to make the world a better place in the long run. The transition is not going to be comfortable for a lot of people, but that doesn't mean that you have to be directly in the middle of whatever that fight is. Maybe you do. Um, but I think that generally speaking, you know, in aggregate, we don't. Um, and there's never a reason to stop being um, constructive and loving and creative and kind and compassionate and, and strong. You know, it requires a tremendous amount of courage um, to to withstand something like that and continue to keep your eye on the light. Um, you know, the, 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 the thought of meekness, uh, I think Jordan Peterson sort of made this famous, um, meek, not meaning, you know, like me, I'm like, I'm super weak, you know, like it meaning that, you know, how to people who know how to use their weapons, but decide to sheathe them, <laughs> you know, something like that. Um, or the concept of like, you can't be peaceful if you're not capable of great destruction. Uh, they're two sides of the same coin. Um, so I don't know. I hope there's just a message of uh, a little bit of hope there. That was at least my own personal realization, you know, that, that darkness works for – darkness knows who it works for. It's not, it's not the end of things. <laughs> it is – it pales in comparison to the frequency of creation itself, the frequency from which all things become – how could you possibly be more powerful than that? 
um, and the trajectory is is overall positive. Yeah, especially the, that with Jordan Peterson is, uh, is, is such an eye-opening thing, as, as he puts it. Uh, I think he puts it as like, um, if you are not uh, strong and dangerous, uh, but still uh, loving, caring, and, and just like not dangerous to the society, you're not really disciplined. Like if, if you are if you could not, um, if, if you're not having a really powerful weapon as, as like your body or whatever, uh, uh, like, <laughs> how do I put it? He puts it way better than me, of course. Uh, but it's like uh, having a, a weapon and being able to shoot someone and not doing it because of discipline, that's discipline. But not having that weapon and not shooting someone is not discipline because you don't even have the capacity of, of shooting someone. I guess that's 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 a point that you wanted to make. And uh, I, I love that uh, the, the, the comparison of, of what John Peterson is saying uh, a, a lot. I think it's uh, it, it makes a lot of sense and... I don't know how he how he, he phrases it, but it's also like become dangerous, but be disciplined with it. So something like that. Uh, he makes a message, and I think it's it's very um, it's a nice it's, it's a really great message uh, to make. I, I love it a lot. It's really cool. Yeah, like I mean, just kind of I, I don't know. Trying to synthesize what I said down even further is like all you have to do is choose the team. Like just choose the team of creation. Don't choose the team of destruction, and you're on the winning team. Like you're on the winning team. Like it's undefeated, <laughs> you know, like, it, you know, obviously there are periods of human history that are horrific and I'm not trying to downplay that at all. Um, but in aggregate, in the long run, uh, you kind of have one choice to make. And I think that's the choice. And if you can make that choice, just have faith and trust that you're on the right team and you're going to win. Like we are going to win. There's no question in my mind about that. Absolutely. Very cool. Uh, with that, let's come to the end routine of the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Uh, your previous guest uh, asked the question, when do you foresee hyper Bitcoinization happening? That's a cool, uh, I've never heard anybody do that. That's a pretty cool little structure there. Um, when do I see, okay, I guess we'd have to define hyper Bitcoinization in that, in that context. So how would we, do, what's your definition of that? That's a, that's a deep question, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, I would just like to make it easy. I would say that Bitcoin is as a unit of account, as a medium of exchange and as a store of value uh, used more than 50% all over the world in all of those three categories. So like it's, it's, uh, it's the most dominant store of value, most dominant unit of account, and most dominant uh, medium of exchange uh, all across the world, but they're still... Uh, other forms of currencies, uh, because th that's kind of for me have a Bitcoinization. If if it, if it comes even to the point where there's only Bitcoin, like Bitcoin is not dominant in all those categories, but it's the only thing we we only measure everything in our world in in Bitcoin, and we measure everything, uh, and we only transact in in Bitcoin. I think that's pretty far out <laughs> uh, and it's 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 better to measure like that like when do we come to a when when does bitcoin become dominant and that and that's i think probably the beginning of hyper bitcoinization <clears throat> man um you know you know what comes to mind here i'm gonna like stretch this out and then try to answer it you know i i haven't i've never thought of it this way but maybe maybe there's an argument to be made um a, a definition of hyper bitcoinization is when Bitcoin has overtaken sovereign debt as a as a global savings account such that there's no outsized authority by any particular sovereign to control the price of money. You know, I, I, I certainly see fiat currencies being around. There's a lot of reasons for those to exist, um, whether you agree with it or not. Um, so I don't know, let's maybe that number is um, maybe that number is 200 or 300 trillion, um, something like that. I, I don't I don't see that happening for, I, I would say, 35, 45, maybe 50 years. Um, I, I think that. I, I look at it also um, in terms of generations. You know, so another way to frame it is like how many how many new groups of human beings need to be born uh, with Bitcoin as a, an assumed um, part of life 
kind of the way the dollar is we're born into the money we have you know and so in that case 50 years that's two generations like that 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 compresses that time frame a lot like that it, generationally speaking that doesn't seem like a lot um to me so i, I would say let's call it 50 years mm. uh seems seems realistic yeah um i will be in bitcoin amsterdam and actually when this comes out i already was in bitcoin amsterdam uh and there we will speak about the vision for 2050 so in 26 years and it's already very hard to, to define like what's happening 26 years because when you think <laughs> about it it's hard to think about next year and we usually overestimate what we can do in one year and we underestimate what we can do in uh, 10 years but it's completely uh, mind-blowing what can happen in 26 years like we can go uh, down like a really hyper bitcoinist world already in in that time frame because a lot can happen in that time frame but yeah it's it's really interesting uh, and 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 uh nice and fun to to talk about that uh in the end of the day it's it's, it's hard to to really pinpoint something uh but i think if we all kind of speculate and and we take the directional thing of that uh, we we might be uh, at least directionally uh, um, correct uh, in a, in a sense. Yeah, really cool. Um, yeah, thank you so much, uh, uh, Zach, for for being on the show. Thank you so much for taking the time. Before I let you go, where can people find you, ask your questions, and and hear more about you? Uh, all right. So uh, I'm personally on Noster. Uh, my Nippo Five is, uh, and I didn't realize you could do this until recently. I was like, duh. But um, instead of having to share the crazy. Uh, you know, pub key or whatever. <laughs> um, uh, Zach at IndieHub, I-N-D-E-E, hub.xyz. Uh, Zach at IndieHub.xyz. That's my Noster address. Um, uh, IndieHub is on Twitter at IndieHub. Again, I-N-D-E-E-H-U-B. Uh, website's IndieHub.studio. Um, you can go there, check it out. Um, and uh, yeah, man, I think... Uh, I think that's it was that was that all the last questions cool absolutely yeah thank um, you so much no uh, this was a blast man the um, i'm glad uh glad you enjoyed it uh yeah then thank you so much for your time thank you so much also for everyone that is watching and listening uh and uh, and joining us today as always i'll be back tomorrow with another episode bye bye uh, see you